if you will, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to be looking tonight between verses 18 and 21. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. The uh, sign behind me on the screen, there's a pretty good chance you've probably seen something like it as you've driven around town. I know a lot of car dealerships like to use the, the uh, banner that says under new ownership. Uh, all kinds of businesses and restaurants use it. Uh, there's a difference between being under new management and under new ownership. Under new management is still owned by the same people, it's just being managed differently. Under new ownership is completely different. There's somebody else who has purchased that business. There's somebody else. Um, th I think it, there's somebody else in charge. There's somebody else calling the shots. And so when you see under new ownership, you're looking at something that has a change from top to bottom. Could be new owners, along with new management, sometimes even new staff. I mean, everything is changing. Christians can relate to that. We can relate to that. Because when we became Christians, we were placed under new ownership. When we became Christians, we had everything change in our life from the top to the bottom. We're not talking under new management. We're talking about being under new ownership. And that ownership is from God. We are that which He has purchased with His blood. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. We're going to go through each verse, break it down, and we're going to see how. How did we come under new ownership and what does that mean? Let's read our text first and then we'll come back and look at it individually. It says this, no, verse 18, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. It looks like such a short passage. And sometimes I think we read it so quick, we miss some of the keys. I, I'm not a big fan of using the thing keys, you know, there's a key to this, key to that. But we do miss some of those points that we have to consider. There are some things that if we um, highlight them in this passage, we'll begin to see how it was possible for us to come under new ownership. I want to give you some of these tonight. Here's the first thing that Peter talks about. We've come under new ownership by redemption. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, he says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, things that rust, things that fall apart, things that get old. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and look at verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Look at all that Christ became to us. I didn't count those things. Let's go back and look. Became wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Four things received under Christ. Four things that became our possession when we became a New Testament Christian. We were a people that were redeemed. Back, in, I'm, You still do it today. You can redeem cans and things of that nature. But I do remember when I was younger that we used to walk along the sides. Like, you can't do this today. It's so dangerous. But there I was as a 12-year-old kid walking alongside the highway. You remember doing this, picking up cans? Because for some reason, our parents in the 70s thought you could just throw trash right out the window. I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, but we would walk along the highway, and we would pick up cans. And we would take them down to the recycling center, and lo and behold, they would give us money. Um, you look on some bottles today. In fact, I noticed that they put it back on Coke cans. It says, please recycle me now on the side of Coke cans. But you see that there's a monetary benefit. If you take that bottle or that can back in, uh, if you redeem it, there is a price, there is an amount that you get. We are a people 
who have been redeemed. Uh, you know, in California, they do it backwards. In California, you pay the redemption price in advance. So if you buy a soda in a glass bottle and the redemption price for it is 10 cents, they charge you in advance 10 cents so that you will take that bottle back and get your 10 cents back. Right? Well, that's what Christ has done for us. He's redeemed us. That redemption is there long before we ever claimed it. It's there since the cross of Christ. It was there waiting for us to be a people who were redeemed by the blood of Christ. That redemption is there waiting for those who are going to be in the future, my grandchildren. It's waiting for them that they're going to be able to be redeemed in the future, that they'll be given an amount, right? That there's a price that has been placed upon them because they've been redeemed. Look at these words in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. It says, Who gave himself for us, this is Christ, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, well, a soda can along the highway isn't a fair comparison. I get that. It's redeemed for some pennies on the dollar, right? But this is redemption from every lawless deed. This is a redemption that brings us from a place where we don't want to be lost in sin to a place where only Christ can make us be, a people that are redeemed. There's a song that we sing all the time, Redeemed How I Long to Proclaim It. We're a people that are under new ownership because we've been redeemed. Here's a second point to consider. How has our redemption been done? We're under new ownership by blood. In verse 19, in the first part, Peter goes on and he says this, but with the precious blood. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and look at verse 14. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Nine pints of blood coursing through your body at this very moment. Uh, nine, type, nine pints of blood that make no doubt about it keep you alive. You have to have blood. Without blood, there's no life. It's the same thing when we talk about spiritual existence. Without blood, there is no life. But not just any blood, church. We're talking about being under new ownership. Anybody can donate blood to you. Right? Anybody can give you blood, but this is a different blood when we talk about being under new ownership. This is the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And go down to verse 13. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ, not my blood, not your blood, not the blood of anybody else, but the precious blood of Christ. I, I have underlined up their blood because it's one of the things we're highlighting, but notice that Peter perceives it with the word precious. This is some pretty important blood. This is blood that is pretty essential. And it's blood that brings us as a people of faith who enter into this spiritual relationship with God through obeying the plan of salvation, that we become a people who are redeemed, a people who purchased, and that purchase price wasn't dollars, nickels, dimes, and quarters. It was blood. It wasn't just any blood. It was the blood of Christ. Not just any blood that he had, but his precious blood. So we're under new ownership by blood. Here's the third one. We're under new ownership by Christ. Stay there in verse 19. The second part of it, it's stated that we're under new ownership by Christ. Do you remember John chapter 3 and verse 16? A familiar passage to, well, I would say it's probably the most familiar passage to the world. Everybody knows it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten cousin. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten nephew. Now you see it's more personal than that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. The choice of having life in the Son is yours. It won't be forced upon you. It isn't given and granted automatically. One must, through obedience, do those things that are required to receive the gift that God is giving us. That gift is given by somebody very specific, by Christ. Go over to Galatians for just a minute. Galatians chapter 4, and beginning in verse 4. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. God sent forth His Son. It's personal. It's an intimate relationship. It's, it's not an extension of a family that exi uh, uh, Our extended family is important. Don't, don't misunderstand that. But this is an extension through an extended family. This is on a personal level. And this is on a specific level. God gave His only begotten Son. He has one. And He gave that one for us. Why? Because we needed to be purchased. Why? Because only blood could do it. Why? Because Christ was that sacrifice for us. Why? Because we have to be under new ownership. Management is just a remodeling. Ownership is is a reimagining. And that's what it does. Peter goes on. And he talks in the third part of verse 19 that we're under new ownership by sinlessness. Not ours. He says without spot or blemish. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look at verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's the sinlessness of Christ. Let me give you real quick. Go over to Hebrews 4 and verse uh, 15. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Speaking of Christ, he says these words. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So this is a pretty important point. It's not the sinlessness of man, because man's never attained uh, sinlessness. It's the sinlessness of Christ. That's the one that we've been talking about. That's his blood that we've been talking about. That's the only begotten Son of God. That's the one who's made it possible for us to be under new ownership. Why? Because he was without spot. Because he was without blemish. He did not have and did not commit sin. Now, I think there's at times a misunderstanding that occurs here, and I think it's a good point to address it. There are those who, when talking about imputed sinfulness, there are those uh, given to, imputed, given to, applied to. Um, there are those who say on the cross, Jesus literally became sin. Now, there's a problem with that. He literally took on the penalty for sin. He was the Lamb of God, he was that sacrifice. But if he literally became sin, as some supposed, then how in the book of Revelation is he the sinless Lamb of God? He couldn't be anymore. After the cross, he would be sin-filled. But he's not. He's not presented that way. When it comes to the to the to that which is waiting for those people in the future to become Christians, it's not presented, it's not teach as one. Well, at one point he was sinless, but now he's become sin because of man. That's not the proper understanding of becoming sin. It's taking that penalty upon himself. He took him who was without spot or blemish, who knew no sin, to become sin. In what sense? The penalty the consequences. Nobody else could be that sacrificial lamb of Christ. It wasn't it John who said, behold, the lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. Only Christ could fulfill that place. Go over to 1 John. 1 John. Chapter 3. And look at verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. 
we're under new we're under new management because of sinlessness because there was that which was pure well that which was holy that which was pleasing and acceptable to God and because of that holiness that sinlessness God could say to us I'm giving you a rebirth I'm giving you a rebranding you're becoming something new right you're under new ownership because of your encounter with sinlessness let me give you another one stay there in first Peter go down to verse 20 we're under new we're under new ownership by foreordination foreordination for ordination, right? I'm going to get it out eventually. It says he was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Um, I don't know if it was on our Thursday night program or if it was last week's Bible class. I can't remember. But Leland was talking about being foreordained. And he said, I think it was a TV program. And he said, you're not foreordained to be saved or lost like the world teaches, especially Calvinism. But what, what would be done was foreordained. Who would we be done through was foreordained. There wasn't anybody but Christ that was coming to die for our sins. There wasn't a guy named Sam or Bill or Jim or Jeff who was coming. It was Jesus Christ. It would be all fulfilled in him. He was foreordained to be the sinless lamb of God. What one would receive, the forgiveness of sins, was foreordained. What would happen was it, well, I don't know what's going to take place. Now that Christ has died for our sins, what's going to happen? It was foreordained. It was planned in advance. It had a purpose in advance that through Christ our sins would be washed away. And we would be uh, restored to that unhindered relationship with God through Christ. Look at um, 2 Timothy 1. Second Timothy 1 and verse 9. It says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now this is one of those verses where you have to work backwards. Okay? It's one of those verses where you work backwards. So let's begin at the end of the verse. And what Paul is saying is here, he talks about before time began. Well, what? What's there before time began? Well, work back. You see that Jesus Christ worked back. You see the purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus was given to us before time began. It was foreordained by God. That through Christ there would be purpose and grace. That Christ would have a point for coming, a plan for coming. It would contain the grace of, I don't know how. You talk about having a relationship with Christ, a relationship with God, and not factoring into it a relationship that's based on grace. I don't know how that's possible, right? Um, you know, so this is this is me. Um, sometimes I, you know, I, I, so, I don't. Sometimes I don't want God's justice. I want God's mercy. I don't want God's justice because I know I'm guilty. I want God's grace. That grace is extended to us through Jesus Christ. Not just because, as some would say in the denominational world, well, he came to set up an earthly kingdom and he didn't succeed. So the church is your second place prize. You see, that's what you're getting because the first prize couldn't be given to you. It doesn't work that way. It was foreordained before the foundation of the world that the blessings that we receive would come to us through Christ, manifested in these last times. Titus. Look at Titus. Chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Promised before time began. He foreordained that we would come under new ownership. Those who would obey. He foreordained that we would come under new ownership. Now that takes some planning and some purpose. 
That takes some forethought to say that, listen, I know there are going to be those who are going to be faithful. I know those are, there are going to be those who are going to respond to my son. And because of that, I need to have something in place. Not as a second place prize, but because of a first place reality. It's Christ. We're under new ownership by being foreordained. Here's another one. We're under new ownership by death and resurrection. 1 Peter 1, just the first part of the verse, verse 21a, it says this, Who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory. Um, I, I preach out of an electronic Bible, but I, I study out of a paper one. And in my paper body, the Bible, when it comes to the first part of this verse, I have raised and dead underlined. And this is just the way it works in my mind. 